good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the NCSL Legal Services Staff Section Sentence Diagramming Webinar. Several times during the presentation, participants will be asked polling questions. Please click on your response as quickly as possible so that we may share the results of the poll with you. Participants may type questions to the presenters in the chat box on the lower right side of the screen. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Kay Warnock, Policy Specialist, National Conference of State Legislatures. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Welcome to the fourth Legal Services Staff Section webinar. This webinar is supported by an e-learning grant from the Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee. Legislative staff from 33 states and the District of Columbia are in attendance today. You should all have a seven-page handout in front of you to use during this webinar. If you don't have the handout, send me your email address in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll email it to you during the presentation. You will be sent a copy of the slides for the presentation following the presentation. We are very pleased to have Wendy Jackson, a legislative editor, and Kathleen Hanneman, a legislative attorney from the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau as our speakers today. Their expertise will help us to use this analytical tool to improve our writing. Hello, Wendy and Kathleen. Hello. Hello, thank you, Kay. I also welcome you, attorneys and editors from all over the nation. This is Wendy, and I will get us started using an old tool, sentence diagramming, for a modern job, drafting or editing legislative proposals. Here is some background information about me. I have a technical writing degree, and I've been a legislative editor for a lucky 13 years. Even though I feel like I have a lot of experience working with words, phrases, and clauses, I never learned to diagram. Now that I've designed this presentation for you, though, I'm on my way to being an expert diagrammer, and I've added this great analytical weapon to my editing arsenal. What about you, Kathleen? Did they teach you this in law school? No, Wendy, this is not part of the core curriculum of law school. I'm Kathleen. I started at the LRB with Wendy, but unlike Wendy, I lack a degree in writing. So all my grammar knowledge comes from schoolhouse rock in the 70s. So sometimes I'll burst into a song, although I can't sing, about unpacking your adjectives or conjunction junction. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. And before Wendy asked me so politely to present with her, my exposure to diagramming sentences came only from the book Little Town on the Prairie, where Laura Ingalls Wilder has to diagram and parse sentences to pass her first teacher's examination. And some of you know about that, too. We can't go a single day without you mentioning Laura Ingalls Wilder? Why should we, Wendy? Anyway, are you attorneys and editors sitting there saying to yourself, did they just say we're diagramming sentences today? Yes, we did. That's what we hope to teach you or remind you of today. As you look at this slide, I am lumping you into one of three categories. Category one, you're thinking, what the heck is this? Category two, you're thinking, oh yeah, I remember doing this in school. It was kind of fun. In category three, you're thinking, oh yeah, I remember doing this in school. Yuck. Regardless, I think this presentation will be useful to you because diagramming sentences involves the same kind of language skill we use to write or edit, but diagramming helps us to see sentences in an entirely different way. Here are some reasons why you should learn or relearn to diagram sentences. Whether you're an attorney or an editor, your job is language intensive, and you already make patterns out of words, phrases, and clauses as you write or edit legislation. Diagramming is another way to make a pattern. Mix up your drafting or editing process a little. If you're a drafter, you can use diagramming to get rid of writer's block. Is that right, Kathleen? I think so. There's a lot of ways of getting rid of writer's, blo writer's block when I can't think of what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I say it out loud, but you can also start thinking of it in terms of the parts of the sentence, and diagramming can help you see where you're going when you're writing. You didn't mention Laura that time. Thank you. I'm getting better. Okay. I'm going to stick my neck out here and claim, without having scientific evidence, that diagramming is a right brain activity. Writing or editing statutory language is generally a left brain academic activity. In your job, you think sequentially, you pay attention to details, you use language functions and grammar rules, and you analyze text. Diagramming a sentence requires visual thought, not verbal thought. When you diagram a sentence, you make a drawing and you reorient the sentence spatially, 
which are generally right brain artistic activities. Furthermore, the process of visualizing the sentence in a different way in and of itself can help you get at the sentence's meaning. To diagram, you must set aside the meaning to focus only on the subject, predicate, object, any dependence or modifiers, and so on, and then put it back together. The truth is, you can diagram a perfectly ungrammatical sentence. Kathleen, can you think of any good ungrammatical sentences? I always try to use good grammar, but you could diagram me uses good grammar, or you could diagram a perfectly untrue sentence, such as, the Packers are not the best team in football, which we all know would be untrue, but I could diagram that sentence now that I've learned from Wendy. You are always good for splendid examples. You must know parts of speech and how to deconstruct phrases, clauses, and sentences to diagram a sentence. You can write a decent sentence or do some editing without being an expert in identifying these things, but you will do your job better if you can be an expert, and learning to diagram will certainly put you on that path. Diagramming can help the editor articulate problems to the drafter and vice versa. Goodness knows Kathleen and I could use a little help communicating sometimes. Still not convinced you should diagram sentences? Then let's think about why anybody juggles. For one thing, juggling is fun. Kathleen is juggling right now, in fact. Oh, wait, I dropped one. Diagramming sentences is fun, too, and can make the sometimes dry technical job of crafting legislation more fun. For another thing, juggling has been shown to be good for the brain. In 2009, researchers at the Oxford Center for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Brain showed that juggling, learning to juggle enhances connections in the brain. If learning to juggle is good for the brain, and I'm knowing going way out on a limb here, then so is diagramming sentences. Compare juggling to diagramming. When you juggle, you throw balls up in the air in a pattern and catch them. When you diagram, you throw words up and out of a sentence and catch them on straight and angled lines in a pattern. I'm telling you, somebody should do a study on this. Okay, take a look at the first stanza of this poem, Purple Cow. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. And now take a look at the related diagrams of the second line. Someone recently pointed out to me that the second line was written incorrectly, or that it just sounds better as I hope to never see one. Should the poet, Gillette Burgess, have recast the second sentence, split that infinitive to see? I do not know, but look at how the diagrams differ depending on the syntax of the second sentence. You may be wondering how the sentence diagram came to be. Clark's 1860 book, A Practical Grammar, offered a system of bubble diagrams, many of which resembled funny-looking animals. Kathleen, did you say that Laura's diagrams looked like bubble diagrams? Yes, they were all bubbles. They were drafted. All the words were in little circles, and there were no straight lines. It might have been harder to juggle them. Hmm. So Laura and Clark were contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Then Reed and Kellogg's book, Higher Lessons in English, took the bubbles and turned them into an elegant system of lines. And yes, I do mean elegant. House and Harmon's book, Descriptive English Grammar, expanded on Reed and Kellogg's system, which is still in use today. For this presentation, I used Reed and Kellogg's book, which offers excellent explanations and examples. I found an original copy at the UW Library sitting on my desk right now. That reminds me I should return it today. People are probably clamoring. So let's start diagramming. In these first slides, I will show simple diagrams to focus on parts of speech, the verb, the noun, the pronoun, the adjective, the adverb, the preposition, the conjunction, and the interjection. The interjection. Sorry. Please your eyes on the diagrams without concentrating too much. Kathleen will add actual words to these same diagrams later. Here you see the simplest of diagrams, depicting one subject and one predicate. The subject could, in fact, be one noun, and the predicate could, in fact, be one verb. I should mention here, too, that we do not diagram punctuation. And sometimes I feel like my life would be easier without punctuation, so diagramming is a refreshing activity in that respect. The appositive, such as an intensive pronoun, goes in parentheses after the noun it renames. Sometimes, as in a command clause, the subject is implied. 
In this case, put parentheses around the implied or understood subject. Because an interjection or a noun of direct address is not grammatically related to the rest of the sentence, diagram the interjection or a noun of a direct address on a floating line above the independent clause. A modifier, such as an adjective, adverb, or article, goes on a slanted line beneath the word it modifies. It's difficult to show you the preposition without diagramming the whole pre prepositional phrase, which looks like this. The preposition goes on a slanted line, the object goes on the straight line, and any article goes on a slanted line beneath the object of the preposition. The conjunction, whether coordinating or subordinating, goes on a dotted line that connects words, phrases, or independent clauses to make a compound. Aren't they dashing? Dashing. Whether the line is vertical, horizontal, or slanted depends on the conjunction function in the sentence. Huh, that sounds like a schoolhouse rock song. Mm, bet for you. Since we diagram personal pronouns, indefinite pro pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, and reflexive pronouns as subjects or objects, and we diagram possessive pronouns as modifiers, we need to concern ourselves here only with the relative pronoun. The relative pronoun and the relative clause it introduces sit on a straight line at the end of a slanted dotted line connecting to the antecedent in the main clause. And here we come to our first polling question. In the following sentence, laughing is what type of verbal? An infinitive, a participle, or a gerund? Are you giving him a time limit? Well, we're waiting for the results to come in. Oh. There we go. Here they come. It looks oh. like most of you guessed incorrectly. Oh. If yes. you said a participle, you are correct. So far, I have covered parts of speech, and we are on our way to building phrases. As you know, a phrase is two or more words that do not contain the subject predicate pair needed to make a clause. I have already shown you how to diagram prepositional phrases. We will also need verbals to make participle, gerund, or infinitive phrases. The participle goes on a curved line below the word it modifies. Why is it curved, Wendy? Well, because the participle is always an adjective, and the curve begins as a slanted modifying line. Hmm. Diagram the gerund on a step. The infinitive looks like this. Two goes on the slanted line, and the intransitive complete verb goes on the straight line. As I promised, we are about ready to build phrases, but I need to say a little bit more about verbs. So far, my slides have shown intransitive complete verbs. Raise your hand if you knew that. Good job, Kathleen. <laughs> This slide shows the transitive active verb, which takes a direct object and sometimes an indirect object. As you can see on this slide, diagram the direct object after the verb. Draw a shorter vertical line between the verb and the direct object. The indirect object goes beneath the verb on a crooked line, similar to one used with a prepositional phrase. The X implies two. The linking verb connects the subject with the predicate that either renames or describes the subject. As this slide shows, diagram the predicate noun or predicate adjective after the verb. Draw a backward slash between the verb and the predicate. You could think of the slash as pointing back to the subject that is being renamed or described. Do you think they did that on purpose? I think it was intentional. Diagram transitive passive verbs like this. The arrow here is for your reference only. 
to show that the auxiliary verb and the main verb point back to the subject receiving the verb's action. For the editor, this construction might raise red flags, since, as George Orwell said, one should never use the passive when the active will do. For the drafter, though, the passive voice is sometimes appropriate, even necessary. The passive voice is hated by editors. Allow me to introduce the noun phrase. and the verb phrase. And you've already met the prepositional phrase. This slide shows the participle phrase, which, as I said, always acts as an adjective. Raise your hand if you remember that. I remember. The participle sits on the curved line, and any modifiers go beneath. Here, a prepositional phrase modifies the participle. Here is a gerund phrase. See how the gerund sits on the step. Any objects or predicates go on the horizontal line after a vertical slash or backward slash, and modifiers go on slanted lines beneath. Loft the whole phrase up onto a pedestal above its position in the main clause. In this slide, the gerund phrase is the subject of the main clause. Here is an infinitive phrase. See how the infinitive goes on the crooked line, the to goes on the slanted line, and the verb goes on the straight line. Any direct object or predicate adjective or noun goes on the straight horizontal line after a vertical slash or backward slash, and modifiers go on slanted lines beneath. Loft the whole phrase up on a pedestal above its place in the main clause. In this slide, the infinitive phrase is the direct object of the main clause. Even though you are unlikely to see absolute phrases in your legislative drafting or editing, I show it to you here. The absolute phrase consists of a noun with a participle used independently, and it stands by itself because this kind of phrase has no grammatical connection to the rest of the sentence. Hmm. And here we've arrived at our second poll, which consists of four questions. We want to know if diagramming looks familiar or not. Did you diagram or parse sentences in school? Interestingly, diagramming and parsing are not the same thing. They are cousins, yes, but parsing is verbally identifying the elements in a sentence, and diagramming is drawing. We're just waiting for the results to come in here. Oh, I'm surprised. It looks yeah. like almost 70% of you learned diagramming or parsing in school. For those of you who learned it, in what grade did you learn it? Looks like grades 4 to 6, 46%, and middle school, 44%. A few of you learned in high school. For the third, nobody learned in law school? Nobody learned in law school. Hmm. In, for the third question, how many years ago did you learn diagramming? And we want to know only because it seems like schools are not teaching it very much anymore. And a colleague of mine has a theory that people under age 50 did not learn it. Let's see. Interesting. So 31%, 40 or more years ago, 
42 percent 25 to 39 years ago and 27 percent 10 to 24 years ago and nobody learned fewer than 10 years ago lastly on this poll did you love diagramming or did you hate it I've done some informal surveying in the last six months, and nobody I have talked with about diagramming has been somewhere in the middle. Everybody, if he or she learned it, has either loved it or hated it, so we didn't even give you a middle-of-the-road option in the poll. <laughs> Did we get that result yet? I can't see the result yet, but we can easily move on. Looks like some love it, some hate it. Hmm. Here we go. Okay, get ready to make some more complicated sentences. We need conjunctions. This slide shows a diagram of a coordinating conjunction connecting a compound subject. See how the conjunction sits on a vertical dotted line. This is a compound verb. This is a compound adjective. This is a compound adverb. And this is a compound object of the preposition. Note how coordinating conjunctions go on vertical or horizontal dotted lines, but never slanted. At this point, I've covered phrases. Do you feel your right brain warming up? Mm -hmm. I do. Let's move on to clauses. To review, the types of clauses are the independent clause and the subordinate clause, of which there are three types. The adjective clause, we sometimes call that the relative clause, the noun clause, and the adverb clause. We have already been working on the independent clause. Here you see the relative clause. Since the relative pronoun can be the subject, direct object, object of the preposition, or a modifier within the relative clause, the relative pronoun's place in a diagram will vary. Here you see the noun clause. It goes up on a pedestal that floats above the position where it must act as the noun in the sentence. The noun clause can act as the subject, the direct object, the indirect object, the object of the preposition, or the predicate noun. Woo. To, add, to diagram the adverb clause, we will need a subordinating conjunction, which you see here on a slanted dotted line that connects the main clause to the subordinate clause. Subordinating conjunctions always go on slanted dotted lines. Remember that coordinating conjunctions go on vertical and horizontal lines. And this slide is my clause finale. Hmm. This diagram shows two independent clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction. And here we have arrived at our third and final polling question. What, was, what color was the cow in the Burgess poem? Black and white, brown, purple, or we don't know, we never hope to see one. Oh, some of you caught on. It was a trick, trick answer. 80% of you said purple, and 20 said we don't know. We never hope to see one. 
Now I'm going to let my esteemed colleague, Kathleen Hanneman, show you some slides that apply real words to real diagrams. You're going to need to stop juggling now. Right now? Right now. Okay. So as you've been asking for, some examples. Here we go. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Did, did we say we were going to sing? No. Here's our examples. We begin with a straight line on which go the subject and predicate. Remember, we don't diagram punctuation. So we've got legislators being the subject, debated predicate. This diagram shows reflective, reflexive sorry, pronoun myself, which is an appositive to the subjective personal pronoun I. The appositive goes in parentheses. You see myself in parentheses. An implied or understood subject also goes in parentheses. Please. You is the understood subject there. So you say, please, you respond. Like I would say, please, Wendy, flip to the next slide. The interjection in this sentence goes on a straight line hovering above the main clause. So please is your interjection. It's separated from the sentence by an exclamation point or by a comma when the feeling's not so strong. So there's your interjection. It's nice to hear you say, please. <laughs> Please never ask me to present with you again. <laughs> There's another example of an interjection. Here, Wisconsin legislators debated. Wisconsin is your adjective. You diagram that adjective on a slanted line beneath the noun legislators that it modifies. You diagram articles as modifiers. So the is your article and it's modifying legislators. Diagram the adverb on a slanted line beneath the verb it modifies. So attorneys write well. Now that's a given. We all understand that. But well is your adverb, and it modifies right. So it goes on that slanted line. <coughs> Sorry, I seem to have this weird cold. <coughs> we do live in Wisconsin, and it does get cold around here. It's 28 degrees today, so I apologize. You diagram an adverb modifying another adverb like this. So quite is your adverb that's modifying your other adverb thoroughly. To diagram a question, turn the sentence around to make it a statement. In this sentence, members is the subject, did caucus is the predicate, and the and democratic are modifiers modifying members. As Wendy said earlier, it's hard to show the preposition without the whole phrase. This slide shows the prepositional phrase acting as an adjective. In is the preposition, and it goes on a slanted line beneath the noun it modifies. Capital is the object of the preposition, and it goes on the straight line connecting the preposition, connecting to the preposition. And the is the modifying article, which goes on a slanted line beneath capital. So legislators who are in the capital debate it. Here, the same prepositional phrase acts as an adverb modifying debated. So where did they debate? They debated in the capital. Combining what you've learned thus far, diagram this Mark Twain quote. I can live for two months on a good compliment. Use the space in the handout. Take two whole minutes to, Wendy says you don't need any longer than two minutes to finish this. So Wendy picked this quote because neither drafters nor editors receive many compliments. I'm sorry, Wendy. You are a great editor. Thank you, Kathleen. And I really like your socks today. I'm wearing boots, Wendy. OK, so I'm, di I'm trying to diagram, and Wendy's going to look at my diagram. How does, oh, you got to go. All right, I'm, I'm going to work on it. Okay, I'm gonna, this is what I did, Wendy. How'd I do? <laughs> oh, that's my version. Okay, here's Wendy's version. 
Oh, that's how it should look. That is great. Here are the subject and the predicate. I can live. The prepositions for and on. The objects of the preposition, month and complement. And the modifiers, to, a, and good. I'm sure you all did better than I did. I told you I didn't do this before now. <laughs> this diagram shows a sentence with a transitive active verb and a direct object. In the diagram, Bill is the direct object, and it goes after the verb and vertical line. Bill. Debated is the transitive verb. And here, as Wendy said earlier, you diagram the indirect object in the same way you would an object of the preposition. The X implies to. In this diagram, reporter is the indirect object. And Wendy, if it really did say gave to the reporter, you would put to there instead of an X, right? That is correct. And gave is the transitive verb. So the senator gave the reporter an interview. Or you could say the senator gave to the reporter the interview. But we don't usually talk like that. Maybe I do. <laughs> Diagram a sentence with a linking verb and a predicate noun like this. Here, law is the predicate noun. And became is the linking verb. And notice that slanted line from law pointing back to Bill, as Wendy pointed out earlier. Well, you really gave us a good, good base, Wendy. I'm catching on now. The predicate adjective describes the main subject. Diagram the predicate adjective after the backward slash pointing to the subject it describes. In this diagram, essential, for a supermajority is essential, is the predicate adjective. And is is the linking verb. Okay, we have covered diagramming intransitive verbs, transitive verbs, and linking verbs. And we have one to go. What is it, Wendy? The passive transitive verb. Raise your hand if you knew that. I didn't know that. <laughs> In this diagram, shall be appointed is the passive predicate that points back to chairperson, which receives the action. And because, as I said earlier, the passive voice is disliked by, disliked by editors, you could easily write the same sentence in the active voice. The diagram looks like this. The speaker shall appoint the chairperson. Much better. Thank you, Wendy. Here we begin to see phrases. This slide shows the noun phrase. The noun phrase is the Democratic members. Nice. Have been running is the verb phrase in this diagram. So those pages have been running all night. Now let's look at phrases using verbals. In this diagram, drafting is the participle. And drafting bills is the participle phrase, with bills being the direct object on that curved line like we said earlier. In this diagram, Working, that word on the steps, is the gerund. The editors were delirious after working on the budget. Delirious, Del I tell you. Delirious. And working on the budget is the gerund phrase that those delirious editors were doing. On the budget is the prepositional phrase within the gerund phrase. That's a nice sentence. Wendy loves to bike. And she does. In fact, she's still wearing her bike helmet now. In this diagram, to bike is the infinitive. Here, to do yoga, what a nice idea, is the infinitive phrase. You all can't see this, but Kathleen has been in curl for the last five minutes. It's, it's difficult, but she needs some arm strength. My guess is you will not come across the absolute phrase in your work all that often, as Wendy mentioned earlier, but we're trying to be as thorough as possible as we show you how to diagram phrases. And maybe after seeing this presentation, you'll diagram sentences instead of doodling during meetings. You start diagramming the sentences of the speaker. In that case, you may need to diagram an absolute phrase. Here, the assembly adjourning is the absolute phrase. 
Note how it is not connected to the independent clause. The absolute phrase is not grammatically linked to the independent clause, so it's separate. And we got to go home. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're moving into even more complicated sentences, and we're going to need some conjunctions. And what's your function? This is a diagram of a compound subject. The coordinating conjunction goes on the vertical dotted line that connects the subject. There it is, and nicely highlighted. Wendy, you did a great job. Thank you. Oh, this is, since guns is one of my drafting areas, this is a really well-written sentence. But it's a diagram of a compound predicate. The coordinating conjunction goes on a vertical dotted line connecting the verb phrases. So you have two of them there. You've got and, and you have either or. That is a well-written sentence. Put that in there for you. Thanks. This diagram shows the coordinating conjunction and between the adjectives Republican and Democratic. The conjunction here links two adverbs. You see and linking your two adverbs willfully and knowingly. Enough of these legal phrases. Maybe we can try to get some CLE for this. <laughs> this diagram shows and linking the objects of the preposition. You have and linking your objects, contracts, and agreements. And as long as I'm talking about coordinating conjunctions, I'll show you here how to diagram a compound sentence that is two independent clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction. We couldn't possibly give a presentation without mentioning badgers, you know, badgers, and also cows, but badgers. Because the badgers are smelling roses these days. It does smell like roses here in Wisconsin. In this diagram, when is a subordinating conjunction. It goes on the slanted dotted line that connects the independent clause and the dependent clause. So we've introduced a new branch of government, too, here. So we've got when being your subordinating conjunction. The independent clause in this sentence is the bill became law. The subordinate clause, when the governor signed it today, is an adverb clause. It qualifies the action of the verb in the main clause by answering the question, when? When did the bill become law? When the governor signed it today. For this reason, the slanted dotted line connects the verb became in the main clause to show that the subordinate clause modifies that verb in the same way an adverb would. I've shown you the independent clause and the adverb clause. Here are a series of slides showing adjective or relative clauses. In this diagram, who is the relative pronoun acting as the subject of the relative clause? The relative clause is who is eligible for the refund? Nice. You could be on a game show. In this slide, whom is the subject of the infinitive to be, and the entire infinitive phrase is the direct object of determined in the relative clause. And the relative clause is whom the department determines to be eligible for the refund. This diagram shows the relative pronoun whose, which modifies the subject of the relative clause. Whose thread count is actually is described in the paragraph? And so this is, yes, we actually do have a state tartan, and Wendy is wearing it today. I am an eighth of Scotch Irish. Yes, so don't wear that again. This diagram shows the relative pronoun that, which is the subject of the relative clause. The relative clause is that has been zoned for industrial use. This diagram shows which introducing the re relative clause, which is the subject of the relative clause. And the relative clause is which contains a derivative of barbituric acid. Okay, here we're moving to noun clauses. Remember how the noun clause can be the subject, the direct object, the indirect object, the object of the preposition, or the predicate noun. Here, noun clause is, here the noun clause is the subject. The noun clause is whoever swears falsely. Here, the noun clause is the direct object. The noun clause is what constitutes a quorum. Thanks for clarifying that. 
Here the noun clause is the indirect object. Remember that the parenthetical X implies to. The relative pronoun whoever is not the object of the preposition to, so it should not be whomever. The entire phrase, whoever works overtime, is. Whoever is the subject of the clause and belongs in the nominative case. Wendy wanted to throw that in because she says a lot of people get whoever and whomever incorrectly. So she wanted to clarify. Not my fault. Here, the noun clause is the object of the preposition. The noun clause is how she was elected to the assembly. Here, the noun clause is the predicate noun. Note that the word that gets a special symbol here for two reasons. First, it's not needed to connect the noun clause to the independent clause and often is not even used. For this reason, nothing in the diagram connects the word that to the independent clause. Second, the word stands outside the grammar of the noun clause. It is a demonstrative pronoun that holds the place of the noun clause while pointing to the fact that the noun clause is coming. For this reason, the word is written on a line above the diagram of the noun clause in the same way as an interjection would be. However, unlike with interjections, the word that is a marker that specifically signals that a noun clause is coming. The vertical dotted line is added to represent this. That's a, that's a complicated one. You're getting some complicated stuff. Okay, so let's put all this together. You got another two minutes. Wendy seems to think that's the ideal time to diagram this sentence. Use the space in the handout. And while you are enthusiastically diagramming, any person who intentionally sets fire to the land of another or to a marsh is guilty of a Class H felony. I will turn this presentation back over to the person who knows all this stuff, Wendy. Whether you all out there are finished or not, let's come back together to look at the answer. How did you do? I did really well, Wendy, but I had the answer in front of me. Let's walk through some of the diagrams. Any person is guilty of a Class H felony is the main clause. Guilty is the predicate adjective in the main clause. Who intentionally sets fire to a marsh or to the land of another is the relative clause. Fire is the direct object in the relative clause. And to a marsh or to the land of another is the compound prepositional phrase. Hmm. After that, I feel like you need a break from looking at diagrams. So let me show you something entirely different. Recently, a co-editor suggested that if you have a sentence that resembles a bowl of spaghetti, diagram it and it will look more like a train yard. Are you buying that? Okay, let's take a look at one last sentence. A person may claim the tax credit if, among other criteria, the person establishes a business that operates on renewable energy and employs at least five employees. This is a sentence based on one that I read in an analysis of a legislative proposal. I had a feeling that the prepositional phrase, among other criteria, was out of place. Does it modify the act of establishing a business or does it modify how the business must operate? So you guessed it. I diagrammed the sentence to see if looking at the phrase in a diagram would help. Did you really? I did. And it looks like this. I diagrammed the parts of the sentence that did not involve the prepositional phrase in question. When I finished, I left my prepositional phrase disconnected from the rest. Hmm. 
I tried it in the position where it seemed to go as written. Among other criteria, seems to modify establishes in the subordinate clause. But is this what the drafter intended? I wasn't sure that made sense. When I moved among other criteria to modify the verbs and the relative clause introduced by that, it seemed to make more sense. A person may claim the tax credit if the person establishes a business that, among other criteria, operates on renewable energy and employs at least five employees. So I took my diagram to the drafter. Did you really? And he said, wow, cool diagram. You can move that prepositional phrase wherever you like. Hmm. A persuasive tool. With that amazing anecdote, we have come to the end of our presentation. We will have some Q&A at the end. Kathleen and I do hope we have put you on the path to finding diagramming nirvana. Why? Because diagramming may help get your right brain involved with your left brain work. Directors out there, diagramming may help you with writer's block. Editors, it may help you visualize a sentence that resembles spaghetti as a more orderly train yard. Not to mention, you will all exude brilliance mm -hmm. as you expertly discuss parts of speech, phrases, clauses, and drum roll, please, sentences. If you've noticed, you are looking at my diagram's compact information. Oh, Wendy. Which may be evidence that I have really gone over the edge. Nevertheless, please feel free to contact me after this presentation should you think of any questions or comments that um, we don't get to today. You should definitely contact somebody if you think Kathleen and I should get our own radio show about diagramming. Don't diagram like my coworker. If you are excited about diagramming sentences, make sure you look at the references page I included in the handouts. You will also find endless information on the World Wide Web, including a Reed Kellogg diagrammer, but I should warn you it's not foolproof. The book itself is better and chock full of examples and explanations like I said earlier. Kathleen, I saw an original 1877 copy for sale on the internet for about 800 bucks. Oh, and I was just wondering what to get you for the holidays. Mm. Thank you for that hint. Finally, I must thank Chris Siciliano, who contributed greatly to this presentation. I really couldn't have put this together without him. And Kathleen, who agreed to be my co-presenter today. Thanks also to my fellow editors who picked up the flat while I've been away in PowerPoint land, which is nothing like Candyland. And thanks to you all for joining us today. Back to you, Kay. Thank you for speaking with us today, Wendy and Kathleen. You have brought a unique and delightful perspective to the art of sentence diagramming. On a final note, an archived copy of the webinar will be posted on the Legal Services Staff Section webpage in a couple of weeks. I'll send all of you a link when it is available. Please share it with your colleagues. Thank you all for participating today. <laughs>